from the BBC World Service in association with ABC and All India Radio. This is Stumped. Hello and welcome to Stumped, your intercontinental hit of news features and debate from the quirky world of cricket. I'm Alison Mitchell and I'm in the Lord's commentary box in northwest London. It's the start of the test season. Feels like there's been a big build up to this one. England's men are starting with a test match against Ireland. Not expecting this one to be a sellout. I think a lot of people are saving their money for the men's and the women's ashes. We will be back at Lord's later for a test match when the men play here. Uh, later in the summer and the women have got a game here as well so it's a lot of cricket coming up in a very short space of time on the international front over here and the scene though it's a little bit overcast for this opening day but I'm looking out across to the wonderful Victorian terracotta pavilion and already the members who have been queuing up for a long long time starting to take their seats. Nice to see you Ali Um, and I've uh, been having a, a little bit of a spell as the winter starts and what I'm looking forward to is being in London in a couple of days' time just before the start of that game at uh, the Oval. But as you can see with my winter woolies on, it is wintry. And so what a good time to escape to a, what I anticipate to be a brilliant English summer with hopefully some brilliant cricket, baz ball and all. We're ready for you, Jim. <laughs> Well, some of the Indian players who've already reached England waiting for that big uh, World Test Championship do claim that it's still a little too cold for them. So we'll see how the whole sweater thing goes, Jim. But hello, I'm Charu Sharma for Akashwani. Glad to be home in Bangalore and glad that there's some red ball cricket in the offing. Ali, you mentioned saving money for the women's and men's ashes. I'm sure a lot of people are saving money for the World Test Championship as well. So that's a big one for at least some countries that are playing good test match cricket. I'm in Bangalore. I'm home uh, where it's been pretty stormy, a fair amount of rain. In fact, record may rain and uh, we managed uh, somehow to get our seniors amateur golf event through luckily here in Bangalore but of course Wow, what a final. <laughs> well, do you know what? We might just start with that this week. Just to say weather-wise, Jim, it is a bit chilly today. I came in with a, a winter coat on and a scarf. So I'm hoping that once this cloud clears away, the sun will make an appearance because it has been beautiful here for the last couple of weeks. So we could do with that weather carrying on because, yes, this test match and then the World Test Championship final to come straight away before the men's and w- women's ashes gets underway. Well, it is the IPL final that we're going to start with because, Charu, it was magnificent, wasn't it? And believe it or not, a final that oh. spanned three three whole days. The final was first pushed back into the Monday, the reserve day, because of rain. And then it was only at 1.35 a.m. on the Tuesday that arguably one of the greatest IPL finals came to an end. And there was remarkable tension and drama, wasn't there, between Chennai Super Kings and Gujarat Titans. Uh, A packed crowd still had energy after one in the morning. And it came down to Ravindra Jadeja needing 10 runs off the last two balls in order to give Chennai Super Kings a record equaling fifth IPL title. They did win by five wickets on DLS. Um, Even just to unpack the last six balls, Charu, of that final, because it was really about who would hold their nerve better in those early hours, uh, with Mohit Sharma bowling for Gujarat Titans. And he'd bowled brilliantly, hadn't he? He'd been hitting his Yorkers under so much pressure and just got it fractionally wrong on that fifth ball. Was it for you the best IPL final that you've seen? Well, we'll have to admit that, you know, the memory sometimes favours recent events. And I can't remember too many other finals, but this one was certainly one for the ages. I mean, just the tension, of course, some of it, most of it came in through the commentary as well. It had everything, didn't it? You mentioned the, the record time as well. You know, not many one day or T20 final stretch over three days. So the, there was a weather to contend with. There was a high scoring uh, first innings where new, a new hero, a new batting hero was born, who, by the way, is from Chennai, uh, <laughs> playing for uh, the Gujarat team. And the crowd, the, the very large stadium, then the rain interruption again. And, I, you know, I mean, the DLS system, of course, you know, if you know how it works, it's all about resources. And even though the target was less and it was in 15 overs, you'd felt that with all 10 wickets in hand, Chennai did have a better chance to get that 170 and change rather than the 215 in 20 overs. But it was magnificent. And all of it coming together um, in addition with the Mm. whole Tony factor because yes, he got out, you know, for a golden duck, he'll be pretty embarrassed about that. But there's so much built on the Tony legend that when it actually comes through again, you feel 
gosh, is there really something, you know, in terms of being a talisman? Yeah, and with the Mohit story as well, wasn't it right that Mohit had initially agreed to travel yeah. with the Titans as a net bowler and then actually ends up making it into the side and bowling <laughs> the final over of the whole tournament? Yeah. But just to recap the, the story of the match, Gujarat batted first on the Monday. They were put in by Chennai, who'd won the toss. We had Sudarasan smashing 96 off 47 balls. Titans making 214 for four from their 20 overs. Then that three-hour rain delay. So the revised target was 171 in just 15 overs. I mean, first of all, you thought that Ryudu was going to see Chennai home in what was his last ever match. So there was that story going on. Uh, he was out in the 13th over. And then, as you say, Charu Dhoni came in. So he thought, well, if it wasn't going to be Ryudu, it'll be Dhoni and that'll be the fairy tale. <laughs> but then he gets out for a duck. Yeah. So the tension really ramped up. Jim, were you able to see much of it in Oz? I mean, when you do have a, a DLS sort of revised target, it is, it is so often the, the, the chasing team who's favoured, isn't it? Yes, I guess that's the case, but I, I didn't see it. Uh, I, I was asleep. I wasn't expecting this sort of delay and everything else. So by the time I got up, the result was on the on the scoreboard. So I could only reflect by reading about it and seeing all the the Twitterati and the, the rest of it that goes around uh, telling you the story on the so social media. But uh, just extraordinary finish, amazing finish. And uh, what did they play, about 74 games in the uh, IPL this year? So what about Captain MS Dhoni? I mean, a lot of people thought it would be the perfect way for him to bow out. He's 41 years old now. But he said afterwards he's had so much love from the Chennai fans that, you know, whilst the easy thing would be to walk <laughs> away with another IPL title tucked under his belt, announce his retirement, he feels he needs to give something back with possibly yet another season. I mean, the, his story just keeps going. Give something back? <laughs> what has he not given so far, Alice? He's given everything, his whole soul and his body to cricket. But, yeah, there's a lot of uh, news about his knee. And, and, you know, it was pretty heavily iced and strapped and everything else. And he went through the whole IPL with a big strapping on his knee. So, um, I, I, you know, and he's mentioned already that he might have to go in for a major uh, operation, some procedure to try and get his knee sorted out. I do think not playing cricket for nine, ten months of the year and then this high-intensity game for two months is probably too much uh, for him. But his franchise, I mean, they will do everything in their power to make sure that Tony <laughs> never leaves the yellow shirt. So the, he'll probably stay as a part of the squad, if nothing else, and perhaps even the captain, although he might go and sort of keep a bit, but he doesn't really need to bat much. And he didn't bat too much this season. Uh, the franchise will be desperate to keep him in the playing eleven, not just as a mentor or whatever, because that seriously reduces... Uh, you know, the, the contribution or the perceived contribution of a player. Uh, I really think he needs to walk away. He needs to say, thank you, done enough. And uh, Chennai are never going to let him go. So he'll return as a mentor slash coach slash whatever. Uh, but he's, he's, he's going to be in the yellow shirt for forever, for his whole life. And he's I got nine sure. months to decide, Jim, hasn't he? But, you know, players often just say when they know, they know. Surely don't he knows by now if, you, if you're really thinking about it to that degree. Sounds like, uh, apart from the emotional reasons, there's, as Charu mentioned, there's a few commercial reasons for hanging around. And he might be. The, <laughs> there always will be. <laughs> the kind of Tom Brady of, uh, of the IPL. You go on for a, another year or two. Um, I mean, 41 is not very old. Jimmy Anderson will be that at any moment, won't he? Yeah. And playing test cricket. So go on, Donny's probably got another two years left in him. Well, barring the knee, of course. But there's pure theatre wherever he goes, isn't there? And it is a Donny factor which lights up any game that CSK play. I thought Hardik Pandya was extremely gracious at the end and really spoke quite meaningfully when he said destiny had this written for him, talking about Dhoni. He said, if I had to lose, I don't mind losing to him. This is uh, Pandya, of course, the Gujarat Titans. He says, good things happen to good people. And I think he is one of the nicest people I've met. God has been kind to me, but I think God gave him a little more today. I just thought that was a wonderful <laughs> phraseology that he brought into a post-match interview. You don't often get words like that spoken but Cherry where do the Titans go from here then because they've only been established for two seasons and they won at their very first attempt and they've made the final uh, now as well so they're still on an upward curve aren't they? 
Oh, yes, they've had another magnificent season. And by the way, it was good Hardik Pandya to drag in the divine. It's like it's nobody's fault. It's what God, God ordained. But it's also true that uh, a lot of people around the world, if I might say so, certainly here in India, are, are happy if Don, whatever Tony is connected with wins. And that was probably the sentiment of Hardik as well. Well, when they've you know finished licking their wounds and when they normalize the Gujarat Titans, they will probably realize that they had another fantastic season and there is nothing broke, so there's nothing to fix. Uh, and they should just carry on the way they are. They're fortunate to have a captain and a leader such as Hardik Pandya, who's from the region, uh, who's still likely to be doing a lot of at least uh, white ball service to the country and, of course, his team, uh, as well as coach and Ashish Nehra, who's also homegrown. So they have a young combination in that sense, and they're likely to carry on in their winning ways for very, very long. Yep, small margins in T20 cricket, that is for sure. But it was a fabulous IPL and a final befitting uh, of a fabulous tournament this year. Well, as you heard on last week's show, I recently spent a week in Uganda in Africa, which was an incredible trip. And I met some really special people there. And I promised that we would bring you a little bit more on cricket in Uganda. And you'll remember that I talked about Konsi Aweko, who is the captain of the women's team known as the Victoria Pearls. And it was Konsi who presented me with the wonderful red and yellow Uganda shirt, which I wore on last week's show. And we've got Konsi with us now, wearing her own Uganda shirt as well and looking very bright along with it. Konsi, it's great to see you again. How are you doing? I'm very fine. Good morning from Uganda, Kampala. I'm happy to be on this uh, uh, forum and I'm happy to talk about cricket from Uganda. Yeah, it's great to have you on to share some of your story with us as well. And um, before we get into the actual team and what you've been achieving lately, will you share with us your story of how you got involved in cricket in Uganda? Uh, cricket in Uganda, I got involved in cricket, I would love to say, around 20 years ago. I, I was uh, a student in some school, in my primary school. We had the chance of playing cricket in my primary school. But personally, I was not given the opportunity because I was in the last level of that school and uh, they needed me to perform well during my class time. So my parents didn't permit me to play cricket that year. Uh, luckily enough, when I joined secondary, uh, the school I was admitted to had cricket. Uh, I got permission from my parents to start playing the game. That was in 2004 at City High School. It's close to the main stadium here at Lugogo. Uh, in senior one, I was uh, given the opportunity to train with the school team and uh, the talent I gave them, the talent I had was enough for me to join the main team as early as senior one. Uh, from that time, I got the invitation from the national team to train with the national team and groom my game. So that's how I got the chance to start playing for the main Team, the women's team. So introduction at school level. At Jim Maxwell in uh, Sydney, Australia, Conzi, how many of your players are full-time professionals? How many of jobs outside? Uh, how is this uh, evolution taking place from just amateur cricket to the women being full-time professional? Uh, we have one player who has, uh, who, who has what to do besides cricket. And the others, uh, we have like five players who are in school. And then uh, we also have the ones who are basically depending on cricket and giving it their best. So it's their full-time job. Konsi, hi, this is uh, Charu Sharma. I speak from Bangalore. Uh, I can only imagine how difficult it is in Uganda to keep your cricketing dreams alive. And on top of all of that, you're a mother, which is incredible that you're still involved in, in doing so well. Um so are there maternity policies in uh, Uganda and how difficult is it for you to manage both the cricket and, well, life at home with the child? I became a mother when I'm playing cricket. Uh, it wasn't uh, so challenging because, first of all, as a player and you have that sports uh, background within you, it was like uh, a swift movement for me as a person because I didn't feel the hiccups of the pregnancy and everything. Uh, the support we got from the association, because after birth, you're given the leeway to come back and join the team. They're not, you're not restricted that, you know what, you're now a mother, you're not going to involve yourself with uh, other girls. Everyone is welcomed. After maternity, you can always join. To me, I was given a warm welcome, and I was encouraged by uh, 
the current board member, Madam Rita Tinker. She was uh, a strong, uh, uh, let me say, someone who was really there behind us, pushing us all the time to come back and play. Cause she told us being a mother doesn't mean that it's the end of your career. It's just the start of your new career. It was in fact a booster to come back and work harder as a mother and also as a player. Cause at one point you're not the only one and the other, the other girls who are going to maybe one time break off, but they have to see from you how well I am going to show them that it's possible. So some girls got that courage because it wasn't easy, but you show them how uh, mentally you have to be strong. You're showing the way, Consi. It's remarkable. <laughs> yeah, I was about to say, Consi, you, you, you must be a fabulous role model for all the youngsters who want to play cricket in uh, Uganda, men or women. Uh, which brings us to some of the successes that you've had. In fact, um, you recently won the Victoria Series in Kampala and then you won the Women's Quadrangular in Namibia. How successful would you suggest the Ugandan women's team is? And, and may I ask whether you, th whether you feel that you're more successful than the men? <laughs> we can't compare ourselves to the men, but our success is, uh, I would say I would give it a uh, 70%, I can't say that we are 100% successful. We've had a lot of ups and downs in our journey of success, but it's also giving us another way to go and work out harder because uh, the success doesn't mean that we've reached our climax. The climax is to play the World Cup one time, but also the success we got in the previous tournaments also has its own uh, downfalls. Like we lost some of the games it also helps us to come back and check ourselves as a team and see where have I gone wrong as a player. We had 70% of the success and 30 to improve on. <laughs> well, I wish you that 30, the missing 30 soon. And so pleased to have heard more about your story as well, Consi. So good luck uh, going forwards. And thank you so much for being with us on Stumped. Thank you too. Have a good day. That's Konsi Aweko, captain of the Victoria Pearls, the Uganda women's team. Well, that's all we've got time for on this week's Stump. So I'll say thanks to Jim Maxwell and Charis Sharma. And of course, to all of you, make sure you're back with us again next week. See you soon. Bye-bye. <laughs>